uh, I'd like to start by showing you this slide, uh, which basically um, tells us the status of uh, global farm reared production. Uh, in 2014, we harvested 4.6 million metric tons. That's the most lucrative aquaculture sector. It generated 20, more than 23 million uh, billion US dollars. But obviously, that has been achieved with ups and downs. If we look at uh, the production in the early 80s, there was a very fast growth of uh, marine shrimp production. Uh, activity grew at a rate of 26%. Then we have a following decade that was basically uh, impacted by uh, the emergency of uh, major diseases such as white spot and yellowhead. So we had a reduction in growth rate and that went down to 6%. And then uh, more recently between 2002 and 2012, we had a very uh, increased growth, mainly driven by Asian um, farmers. And, uh, and this growth that we see that was able to double the production of marine shrimp was basically driven by intensification and the use of uh, the white lac shrimp. So Voname today responds for 80% of the global marine uh, farm rear uh, production, uh, globally speaking. And uh, for those who are not aware, uh, shrimp can go from ag to the consumer stable in less than five months. So a hatchery is done in less than 30 days, between 18 to 20 days, you get PL1, post larvae, I mean PL10, post larvae 10, that it's ready to go to the farm. And then you have transportation, acclimation, you have a nursery stage, and many of the farmers do not do this. That can be just an acclimation phase that will last between five to 10 days, or can be uh, uh, a nursery stage that will last uh, up to 30 days. And then we have grow out, and uh, during grow out, uh, the, the time that uh, shrimp spends during grow out will vary a lot. We may have shrimp that is raised for only 60 to 70 days. Uh, that's shrimp between six, seven grams. And we have uh, also uh, longer production cycles that may last up to 120 days. That will really depend on uh, stocking density, uh, feed management, um, and uh, the size of the shrimp that you want to market. And so it's a it's pretty fast uh, crop, uh, and obviously we have different types of feeds for each stage. We have what we call broodstock diets and or maturation diets, and uh, mostly broodstock is fed with uh, fresh food, that's mussels, polychaetes, artemia, um, squid, but there's also the dried or semi-moist diets that it's used for uh, broodstock. And then we have the larval diets that it's used during the larval stages with a completely different technology from the grow-out diets. Uh, and then we have what, we, what it's called studded diets. They're, these are usually uh, high-protein diets. Mostly of these are extruded uh, with uh, 0 0.8 to 1 millimeter in size. It's becoming very common in Latin America. And then we have the grow-out diets. And uh, these can vary a lot depending on the species that you're focusing on, depending on the stage of production. We also have what it's called anti-stress or diets or transition diets and also finishing diets. So we're going to focus uh, on these type of diets because this, this probably responds for more than 90% of all the feed that it's used during shrimp production. So obviously, uh, shrimp formulation has gone through different stages over the years. I mean, uh, there is a lot of secrecy about uh, feed formulas uh, in the early 80s. I mean, we're using things that we didn't even know uh, what they were used for. So there are many exotic ingredients being used, uh, ingredients that we uh, associated with unknown grown factors. But obviously, that has moved to uh, a later stage in the 90s, where we started to do least cost formulation, looking at the cost, uh, trying to meet the nutrient requirements of that species. That's when we started to get a lot of uh, data from publications on nutrient requirements. And today, we formulate, we need to formulate on a digestible basis. And uh, feeds today, they take a lot of uh, additives and supplements, um, uh, ranging from minerals, 
uh, vitamins, amino acids, uh, organic acids, different types of supplements. So this is a trend that I think is going to continue in the coming years. So when we think about a, a shrimp feed, uh, we have to think of three basic things. I mean, what species we're formulating for? Are we formulating for monodon? Are we formulating for vaname? Uh, what kind of system that it's being used? I mean, is it an intensive system? Is it a, a semi-intensive? So uh, shrimp farming is so dynamic, it changes so much. Even if you take a semi-intensive pond, it can have uh, a farm that is just five kilometers away. It can be completely different from another farm that is five kilometers. Uh, salinity can be different, uh, the, the way the pond is constructed, and that really affects what you're going to do with the feed. And obviously the life stage of the animal. These are the basic things when we think about uh, formulating a feed. There is, for example, a major difference between monodon and vaname. I mean, monodon diets are usually high protein feeds. They can go as high as 40% uh, crude protein. There is still a a lot of uh, marine ingredients being used, whereas when we look at uh, vaname diets, uh, vaname is much more onivorous than uh, monodon. These are soy-based diets. We have commercial diets that, are, that contain as much as 50% soybean meal. Uh, and these feeds are usually lower in protein compared to monodon diets. It can go from 30 to as much as 38%. On average, I'd say it's 35%. And, um, and uh, although 80% of the global marine shrimp production is focused on, on the white lack shrimp, we don't know the nutrient requirements for this animal as we know for monodon. So if we think about formulating a feed for vaname, looking at monodon, you may be spending over, you may be over formulating because even the amino acid requirements are different. If you look at lysine, for example, it's completely different. Methionine, which is a sulfur-containing amino acid, we don't know the uh, vaname requirements yet. We estimate that it's between 0.7 to 0.8 percent of the diet, but we don't know. So we have to be very careful when we formulate a diet for vaname using information from monodon. And uh, as I said, we have, when we look at shrimp farming, uh, we can uh, draw a line between Asian farming and uh, uh, farming that takes place in South and Central America, it's very, very different, basically on the shape of the ponds and how big they are. Uh, and much of the ponds in, in the Americas are semi-intensive ponds. They are very shallow. They operate with low stocking densities that can range from five to a maximum of 40 animals per square meter. Uh, production cycles are usually short. And why do we have to look at the system? Uh, basically because uh, shrimp graze on natural food. So we have to make sure when we formulate that we're not over-formulating, that we're formulating a feed that will allow shrimp to still use that natural food and take advantage of that. Whereas if you go to Asia, it's a completely different system. It's very intensive. I mean, these ponds, they can produce as much as 30 uh, metric tons per hectare per crop. Whereas if you look at a semi-intensive pond, I mean, the highest you can get is about three uh, tons per hectare per crop. Uh, very strong aeration in these intensive pond systems. And obviously, there's still natural food. But natural food that is available there, either, either if it's bioflock, detritus, whatever you want to call it, I mean, the um, contribution of that natural food is very limited because of the amount that animal requirements, not only in, in regards to the amount that shrimp will require, but also in terms of nutrient composition. So in these systems, we have to make sure that we have complete feeds. That does not need to be high protein feeds, but it has to be complete in terms of nutrients. This is a work that we carried out in, in, in our lab uh, and basically shows uh, the white lag shrimp response to the dietary content of methionine in the diet. So it's very clear that when we operate with 50 animals per square meter, we have an inflection point in terms of final growth in the range of 0.7. When we go to 75 animals, it's a little bit higher, 0.81. And when we go with 100 shrimp per square meter, there is more or less of a linear response very interesting. So meaning that the more mats that we added, the 
better the growth that we got. So although uh, above 0 0.7, there was no statistical differences, that's the difficulty when you run trials, studies using green water or bioflux systems. You, have, you need many replicates in order to see differences. And that's basically what a shrimp looks like when you raise them under a green water or bioflux system and when you raise them under clear water. So uh, much of the information that is published on shrimp requirements is carried out under clear water. And I wonder why that happens, because shrimp is not farmed under clear water. But in our lab, you know, we do a lot of contract work for the industry. There are many companies that want to do it in clear water, although I insist that doing the trial under green or bioflock uh, conditions is much better because it will reflect what the animal finds in the commercial uh, setting. So uh, that will also impact the way shrimp will respond to matte, dietary matte content. Uh, for example, in this case here, uh, the higher the matte content, the higher the shrimp uh, final body weight. This was a flow through system. We exchanged water at 14.4% a day. Whereas when we limited water exchange, we had a quadratic response and the maximum level that we got was 0.8 uh, uh, dietary mat content. So everything, uh, it's much more complex when you talk about shrimp because you're not raising the animal in a clear water, in a cage. You're raising the animal in an environment. There's, so, there's a food web there. There's a lot of natural food. So uh, this is a study that we carried out with a, a, a large farm in Brazil. And we wanted to understand how the commercial feeds uh, look like in terms of uh, amino acid composition. So we ran chemical analysis on 91 samples. That was, I think, last year or uh, the year before. And we found that uh, there is major differences, uh, mainly in terms of methionine content and also cysteine. So these are the main amino acids. That's what drives feed costs high, you know. So, but what we had, we had uh, mat levels in the range of mean levels in the range of 0 0.7, but minimum levels of 0 0.3, a maximum of 1.11. So what basically tells us, it's not that the feeds are not good, it basically tells us that feeds are formulated for different systems. If a farmer is, uh, is, far, is, is uh, operating with five, six animals per square meter, you're not gonna feed an animal with a complete diet. You have to make sure that the, the animal is taking advantage of that natural food. Uh, and the other thing that we have to understand is that uh, whatever natural food that you're taking from that environment, you know, it's very limited in terms of nutrient composition. It usually has a lot of water uh, and, and nutrient composition is limited. So uh, maximum, um, protein content, I mean, at least in the lab that uh, I take care of, maximum protein content that we have found in this natural food is around 15%. And it's, there's just not enough, I mean, uh, especially if you're operating under high stock density. So we need to uh, make sure that this natural food can be used, but can be used under low stock density. 20, up to 20 shrimp per square meter, shrimp will use as much of its 50% uh, 50 of its growth will come from natural food. The lower the stock density, the more natural food shrimp will use. Um, and we have done some work with bioflocks. There's a lot of, we have an expert that's gonna be speaking about bioflocks later on, but we have done some work in our lab with bioflocks to understand the contribution of bioflocks to shrimp growth. So we had uh, limited water exchange and we basically vary the uh, amino acid and the fatty acid content of these feeds. We made these feeds to be um, uh, under uh, formulated uh, in terms of amino acid and essential fatty acid. So we did that on purpose by adding less fish meal from zero fish meal up to 12% fish meal and from 0% fish oil up to 2% fish oil. So what we got, this is the data that we got, and I think we had six to seven replicate tanks per dietary treatment, so this was a large trial. So we can see very clear that the higher the fish meal level or the higher the amino acid content, the better was the shrimp growth. Also, the higher the uh, uh, fish oil level, the better was uh, shrimp growth. 
So uh, it basically tells us that we need to make sure that all nutrients are present. What is interesting about this study is that shrimp did not die. We had a very high survival rate and shrimp still grew, although uh, diets were um, under-formulated. And we did also uh, a study uh, looking at the stable uh, um, carbon stable isotope to detect how much contribution the shrimp were getting from the feed and how much he, uh, shrimp were getting from the natural food, from the bioflux. And we found that only 10% of the carbon that was present in the animal muscle came from the bioflux. The rest of it, 90%, came from the feeds. Uh, and and, and the industry today uh, is, still relies a lot on fish meal, mainly Asian uh, feed companies. And, but we have to uh, realize that much of the fish meal that is being used today, it's not whole fish meal, it's byproducts. So there's a lot of uh, uh, tuna, tilapia, sardine, salmon uh, uh, fish meal available in the market. And, but there's also um, uh, feeds are going into using a lot, of, a lot more uh, soybean meal. Uh, there's a lot of rendered animal byproducts available, ranging from poultry byproduct meal, meat and bone meal, uh, blood meal. This is all available, and there's a tons of work that have shown that shrimp can thrive and grow with these different ingredients. Uh, this is a fish meal plant uh, in the northeastern part of Brazil. Uh, it's a, it's a, a farm that produces tilapia and it basically processes all the waste and makes two different types of fish meal, a high protein fish meal, a low protein fish meal. It also produces oil and this is today being used in shrimp feeds in Brazil, right? It's, this is not new. This has been used for I think more than five years. Uh, but what's the consequences of using these different alternative proteins? They are not like fish meal. There's nothing like fish meal. We cannot replace fish meal with a single ingredient. Everybody knows that. And, and the reasons are uh, several reasons, you know. Uh, if you go into uh, soybean-based uh, diets, you're going to have issues with phosphorus, anti-nutritional factors, digestibility, attractability, uh, even water stability is gonna, you're going to have an effect. So, but it's, it doesn't mean that we cannot use them. We can use them because today we have the right tools that allows us to use these alternative proteins. But we have to understand what they are like. We have to do more work on digestibility, in vivo digestibility, and that's a lot of work. And when we look at these ingredients, they are not perfect in terms of digestibility. You see here, land animals, um, poultry byproduct meal, meat and bone meal, feather meal, blood meal, very low uh, protein digestibility. So we have to be very careful where we're sourcing these raw materials. When we see a published work and we see high digestibility, maybe that's not a raw material that is widely available in the market. On a daily basis, nothing is perfect. So you have to make sure that you're sourcing your ingredients from a good supplier, especially when it comes to animal byproducts. Um, and what happens if you don't look at these aspects, right? If you basically formulate it on a protein basis, not supplementing the feeds with different amino acids, that's what happens when we try to replace fish meal and partially replace by blood meal, meat and bone meal, feather meal, another type of meat and bone meal, you have a reduction in formula cost. There's a significant reduction when you take out fish meal. But this reduction, you also have a reduction in performance. So you have to be very careful how you're going to deal with these different ingredients. You need to supplement the diets and you need to know what is that digestible, uh, 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 the amount of digestible protein and amino acids present in that uh, material. Uh, we have, today we have different tools that we can do a quick evaluation of these uh, ingredients when it comes to a plant. Uh, we have NRR, NIRS, uh, which you can do it in, in, as long as you calibrate the equipment, you can do a quick evaluation and, and know even the digestibility of, uh, of that ingredient. This is uh, a trial that we carried out uh, many years ago in Brazil looking at soy protein concentrate, salmon, the salmon industry is using tons and tons of salmon pro, uh, soy protein concentrate coming from Brazil, but the shrimp industry doesn't want to 
you know, they don't like soy, pro soy protein concentrate. It's a great ingredient. It's high in protein. Uh, it has less anti-nutritional factors. And we basically were able to replace all the fish meal uh, when we use soy protein concentrate. We had a, 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 a drop here because we didn't do a right supplementation. But, you know, you can use uh, even, you can have... Um, all plant-based diets, and uh, Voname will perform pretty well. Um, it's not going forward. Oh, no. get 10 minutes extra, Gonzalo. Maybe you should just restart the computer. Many talks open, you know. Okay, there you go. I let it stop. No, there you go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I'm almost finished. Um, so, uh, so it's uh, we can uh, replace fish meal by soy protein concentrate, but it's it's much more difficult working with these different uh, alternative ingredients because you have to do mineral supplementation, you have to use attractants, you have to uh, supplement with amino acids, you know, that's where all the additives come in. And, uh, and one thing that we forget is that when we take out fish meal, there's also an impact in terms of essential fatty acids. So we are able to do that, supplement, that replacement by raising the amount of fish oil that we're using. When we limit the amount of fish oil, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the ability to uh, replace fish meal is, becomes limited. So if we use only 2% fish oil, and if we try to do the same thing and replace fish meal by soy protein concentrate, uh, we can only do it at 31% uh, replacement. When we do at 1% fish oil, we cannot do any replacement. So it's not only dependable on essential fatty acids, I mean on essential amino acids and minerals, it's also dependable on essential fatty acids. Uh, so I just uh, mentioned to you about the uh, NRR. This is a wonderful tool to have it in a feed plant uh, uh, if you're using alternative proteins, especially animal byproducts where cal quality is so variable. Um, it's, it's, that's weird. So uh, one thing that we should focus on also is on manufacturing. Uh, if you do not have good manufacturing practices in place, ranging from grinding, cooking, 
uh, mixing, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what you do with formulation, it's not gonna work. And, uh, and we, we have to remember that shrimp are slow eaters and they feed frequently. They have a very small stomach uh, so they feed, they don't stop feeding. In order to get sufficient energy, it feeds all day long, you know. So uh, how do we deal with that? Uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a major issue in shrimp diets, which is water stability. Uh, usually farms can feed only four or five times a day. Uh, if you feed several times a day, you know, it's much better because you're, gonna, you're not going to lose nutrients. And that's something that we have to realize that in coming years, in the coming years, there's going to be more additives in shrimp feeds. So the more the additives you use, the more leaching it may take, may take place uh, in shrimp feeds. So that's what happens with a shrimp feed, a pelleted shrimp feed, when uh, before you use it, you know, it has oil coating, looks very good, but once you put it in the water, it starts... Uh, you know, losing uh, integrity and uh, a lot of uh, nutrient leaching. Uh, so feed management, although there has been a lot of work done on feed management, it plays a key role, the way, and, and the way you feed and how many times you feed the animal. This is a trial that we just did recently in our lab, uh, feeding the animals using feeding trays, manual feeding twice a day, four times a day, using a mechanical feeder, uh, uh, during the, the whole day, multiple feedings uh, during the whole day and uh, multiple feedings during day and night. So you can see very clearly uh, the way shrimp responded in terms of final body weight. The higher the, the, the number of feedings per day, the better was shrimp performance. And why that happens, it's basically because shrimp feeds today have a lot of additives that are uh, soluble in the water. So the longer the feed stays in the water, the more leaching is going to take place. So one of the strategies uh, is to use attractants. Attractants are playing a, a key role nowadays because you want to do, you want to have the attractant so shrimp will find the feed very quickly and will stay feeding uh, uh, the lo longer, a uh, longer period. So some of the ingredients that we commonly use uh, like blood meal fish uh, oil fish solubles you know uh, like blood meal and fish oil they are not good attractants uh, there is a high level of rejection shrimp will get there it won't eat the feed but if you look at squid fish meal and even fish meal bycatch it has a high uh, level of attractiveness and no rejection uh, so it's highly attracted and palatable to the animal and using plant-based diets, you can see that uh, only 2% of krill meal will improve shrimp performance. Uh, 70 animals per square meter during 72 days. You can see this is an all-plant-based diet. There's only, the only marine ingredient is fish oil. So you can see very clearly that by using only 2% krill meal, we had a good uh, response in terms of uh, performance. So to uh, end my presentation, um, you know, it's not only about nutrition, uh, it, 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 formulation plays a key role, but we have to remember sourcing of raw materials, the quality control that you have in place in the plant, the way you process, you manufacture the feed, also the finished product quality, it's very critical, physical quality, chemical quality, so that's the only way, if we put all this together, is uh, the only way to have a water-stable feed with good attractiveness, uh, which is uh, cost-competitive. Thank you very much.